Commercial multifamily real estate has been proven to stand the test of time, created more millionaires than any other industry in American history. But you might be wanting to retire in 2008. Somebody turned 65 2008 on that day. I'm not saying everybody quit your job. We should probably go into why people shouldn't pay taxes. Made a profit of 200,000. Yeah, not paying taxes on that money at all. What's up, I'm Keith. And I'm D, and this is the Defiant Life Podcast, where we defy, defy the, the laws, laws of mediocrity. mediocrity. Good Always would have messed it up every time. <laughs> you came up with it. Like I you know, it you know. <laughs> I'm like an idiot savant, mm. I think is what they call it. <laughs> yeah. I can I can be super creative, but then I can't remember how to get home. <laughs> so, <laughs> Where are we going? How you long? <laughs> All right, right. How long have you been at Walmart? Uh, <laughs> what county? <laughs> Where did you get that? The uh, maybe did you make this up? The the where are we going thing? No, like, that's just it's like a comedian probably <laughs> said it, and then, and then you came we up. just confirmed. We was like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> so you have to tell the story of what that means. Okay, so all right, <laughs> so there's a comedian that said the difference between black people and white people. There's a lot, mm. uh, and one of them was. When you are riding with a white person and you're getting close to your turn, like let's just say you get into an exit and, and you and it's looking like and feeling like you're gonna pass it, yeah. White people are like, whoa, 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 that's your turn, that's your turn. Like, oh, okay, cool, all right, we made it. <laughs> black people, and this is true, I concur. I've done this a thousand times. Black people will watch you pass your exit and be like, where are we going? <laughs> Every time, so we do it all the time. It's like it's a real thing. I was like, that dude. He's right, you know. So, <laughs> anyway, so speaking of what, what we're going today, Keith, with this podcast. <laughs> well, <coughs> I think we have a couple things we want to talk about. Yes. Um, I think, you know, one of the big things that we talk about a lot is the idea of a gambler yeah. versus an investor. Mm -hmm. And I think most people who call themselves investors are really just gamblers. Yeah. And so it's okay. They, they, they get lucky sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. But in the long run... In my opinion, it's always better to be an investor who looks for steady income versus mm -hmm. a gambler who's trying to make a quick buck. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, let's get into it then. Let's unpack that a little bit. So when you say gambler, mm -hmm. what do you mean? How do you gamble in real estate? Well, okay. So there's really, there's really, well, there's lots of ways to gamble. Yeah. You could buy an empty apartment complex with no tenants <laughs> <Check> <laughs> without doing episode. any, without doing any due diligence. That'd be, that'd be one way to do it. <laughs> um, I think... I think the big thing though, that we talk about a lot is thinking about cash flow versus appreciation. Yeah. So there are a lot of people who invest specifically for appreciation. And then the way we invest is, is for cash flow. Mm -hmm. And so, and obviously we get appreciation as well, but we're, we're coming in looking for cash flow. Mm -hmm. So are looking for how we can create more cash flow. So if you think about just a simple example, think about, um, uh, the stock market, yeah, right. So people invest in the stock market, and over the long term, that is a, a you know has been a safe investment for a long time now. Mm -hmm. Seven to nine percent. Yeah, or you're something. gonna get. Yeah, right. I think you're gonna get seven or eight percent. Yeah, whatever. And you're probably over a hundred years. You're probably not gonna lose money, but you might be wanting to retire in 2008. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> I uh, have a lot of. I have family members who are like retirement age around that time, and then they had enough that they could live not really enough to have to to thrive in retirement but enough yeah. to live off of in their retirement account and then 2008 happened and they're still working now 15 years later when they should have been retired or they had money in mutual funds right mm -hmm. things like that yeah d yeah different retirement accounts yeah. or whatever and uh lost you know half of their half of their net worth yeah um so that is uh you know that that's a thing that can happen when you're when you're focused on appreciation um and you know even if you think about like in, in real estate specifically um think about people who do like flipping different yep. things like this mm -hmm. so flipping there's nothing wrong with flipping houses i've flipped houses before flip mobile homes you know um, there are people who flip multifamily properties too yeah. none of that is wrong it's fine but y you have to understand the risks that come along with that you are very much um reliant on the market swings and, and susceptible to swings in the market. So, uh, I was, when I was caddying, I had, I don't know if I, I think I had just gotten into real estate. No, 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 I had not. This was, uh, this was probably in, uh, like 2010. So, um, it's interesting because I went to college for a long, long time. Right. Right. <laughs> so we graduated in 2002 
And then I was in college until two, the, the December of 2009. <laughs> <laughs> so seven years. And then, uh, and then I went to, um, and that's seven and a half years. Right. So, <laughs> so, and then I moved back home and I had, I had gotten a job in 2003 as a caddy at a golf resort. Mm-hmm. And it was like, a gold mine for a college kid making, you know, a thousand dollars a week in 2003 was like cash. Every yeah. Day. I'm just going to retire tomorrow. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> yeah. And I was coming home with like, you know, $150, $200 worth of cash every day. Yeah. It was amazing. <clears throat> so anyway, in 2009, whenever I graduated, I moved back to my hometown and I had been caddying through some summers. And so, you know, I got a job, I got a degree in philosophy. So mm-hmm. like, what am I going to do with that? Well, right. I'll go caddy and make, you know, it's like double the average income in my hometown. So like, that's what I did. Right. I went and caddy and I did well with that. And I, I enjoyed that job a lot and I did it off and on for a long time. Um, so anyway, uh, I went and, uh, I was caddying for this guy. This was in 2010. So it had just, the crash of 2008 had just happened not mm-hmm. too long before that. Mm-hmm. It really, really wasn't much of a recovery before 2010. So I went back and, uh, this guy said, uh, I was catching for this dude. He was from New York. And I was like, hey, you know, we're talking. What do you do for a living? Whatever. I always ask people. He was like, well, he's like, I don't really do anything right now. I was like, oh, okay. Just retired or what? And he was like, nah. He's like, you know, my wife has a job on Wall Street. And so, you know, I'm just kind of a stay-at-home husband. Wow. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's a that's yeah. a decent gig, I guess. Yeah, it you is. get it. He's like, all right, I just play golf a lot, you know. And um, he was like, I was, a, I was a house flipper. And in 2008, I had like – all of my money tied up in real estate. When the crash happened, I was, I, I was in multiple flips. And, uh, when that happened, I lost, I, th- I can't remember. I, he may have told me like a million, a couple million dollars or something. Mm-hmm. And he was like, um, you know, I lost all of my, basically all of my money that I had and I had no income. And my wife just told me just stay at home. You know, it's better than doing nothing and not making money is better than losing money. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so he was like, okay. So he was just playing golf for a living, you know, <laughs> Professional golfer. Yeah. Okay. Professional golfer. That's okay. <laughs> Not too <laughs> so, bad. Yeah. But stuff like that happens when you're banking on appreciation. You start, mm-hmm. you know, the, the swings in the housing market in, in real estate. If you're a real estate investor who is solely investing for appreciation, mm-hmm. then, you know, that, that stuff can happen. So Yeah, that is, a, that is a gambler's mentality. And that's something we talk about in our course about the difference between being an investor and a gambler. Also, you pay way more taxes in that stuff also. Those capital That's gains true. taxes are steep. Well, it's it's taxed if you if it's less than a year. Mm-hmm. You know, Short term capital gains is just the same as ordinary income, so it's taxed at the highest tax bracket possible. Yeah, yeah. So that, that just sounds bad at the highest tax bracket possible, which is ordinary income. <laughs> that, that's if you think about that, that mm-hmm. makes it even worse. The the regular folks, <laughs> yep, who are just working their nine to five, they're paying the majority the of the ta- of yep. the income taxes. We're just ordinary people. That's why we wanted to defy the laws of mediocrity. We don't want to be ordinary. You know, we don't pay all these taxes. (laughs) We should probably go into why people shouldn't pay taxes, but, you know, that's That's maybe a different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll do Um, a deep dive on that. But, you know, I think think a lot of people come into real estate investing uh, or just investing in general. I guess we should probably define what it means to invest for appreciation. Yeah. So appreciation is basically just buying at a low point and Mm -hmm. selling at a high point. Yep. That's, that's the most basic form of it, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you buy low and you sell high. That's what everybody talks about. The problem is none of us can see the future. No matter how much we think we can, mm-hmm. <laughs> we cannot see the future. We're all meteorologists at best. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. People get paid wrong good. 90% of the time. Right, yeah. <laughs> and people get paid well to try to predict. And what they're doing is they're really just, and I don't, I don't, this is going to sound worse than what I'm intended for it to be, but they're really just playing off of your emotions Right. It's like, OK, I predict based off of this stuff that this, this and this is going to happen. Yeah. So you should feel good about this investment. Right. You know? mm-hmm. And but you really don't know. You don't know what's going to happen at all. Yeah. People, people look. It's, it's, it's always funny to me because people are like, well, you know, I'll be talking to like a financial advisor or whatever. People who, uh, you know, invest money and they're like, man, you know. Over the last hundred years, we've yeah. gotten a seven percent return on this. I'm like, that's cool, but like, mm-hmm. what if I want to retire in ten years? <laughs> what what happens then? You know, mm. well, you know, nobody really knows. Like, you mm-hmm. can't you can't actually predict what's going to happen. Right. If the day you turn sixty five or whatever age you want to retire, yeah, might be the day that 
the stock market gets shut down because yep. you know <laughs> yeah so so somebody turned 65 2008 on that day you know you know you know what yeah. i'm saying mm-hmm. and 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 think about it they've been working their whole lives yeah who knows um yeah i know i know people family members friends who were you know around 2008 07 08 09 yeah they were they were you know ready to retire Ugh. so man yeah um and so i want to talk about another form of gambling also i think having a w2 job is a form of gambling as well right yeah. um because you never know, no matter how long you've been working there, nothing against anybody that works a, a W-2 job, anything like that. But what we're saying is basically when you invest for appreciation, you're not in control. You don't know what's going to happen. When you work a W-2 job, not saying you shouldn't work a W-2 job, but what I'm saying is if that's all you do and you're like, man, I'm safe, I, I clock in, I clock out, there's stability and stuff like that, you never know what's going to happen with that industry you never know what's going to happen with your job. Your boss might come in. Who knows what the – what I'm saying is I think that you need to have more control over your income, over your the money that's coming in. And I think that if you invest in real estate, uh, multifamily real estate, and have some passive income, that's the most control – one of the ways you can have the most control possible is to, to kind of control your time, <clears throat> control your retirement, control your income, and things like that. So – so once again, this is sounding a lot more harsh. Than, I'm not saying everybody quit your jobs and, you know, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is if you're dependent on anything like that, that's not that you don't have complete control over, then that's a gambling mentality also, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast or not before, but um, when I was I owned a fitness company, uh, I don't remember what year it was, but when, when, uh, I had a, a manager who was like a salesperson, you know, at one of the gyms and, um, she was going to get a loan for a house and, and, mm-hmm. and she was on a 1099. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, but she went make commissions on sales that she made and all this stuff and she made, you know, a, a good living. Um, so they were getting ready to buy a house and, and I had to, um, I had to give her some kind of a, I don't remember exactly, but some kind of a letter you know, explaining how she made money basically. And, uh, the bank wound up giving her a loan for that house. And, um, so I, right around that same time I was buying my first house, Mm -hmm. right. With my wife. And, uh, she was, I just got a job as a nurse. So she was a W2, you know, earner. And I was, uh, a business owner. And we went over, we went to the bank, we started looking at everybody's financials and stuff. And I made, or maybe a little more than she did, but around the same, you know, your wife? at that, at that point. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, so it basically doubled our, our mm-hmm. income, but the banker was like, yeah, we don't need to include his income. Cause we can't, we actually can't put him on the loan because he doesn't have, uh, you know, a W2 income. Yeah. And I was like, that's, that's so weird. Like <laughs> the bank wouldn't give me a loan for a house, but they would give my employee a loan for the house just because of the the letters on the tax return. That's crazy. They and, gave your employee. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't know that I was actually planning on firing this person at that time. <laughs> wow. That's ironic. Yeah, it is. And so I don't think I actually wound up firing her, but I had, I, I, we had meetings and I was, you know, con- seriously considering letting her go because mm-hmm. her performance was not as good as I wanted it to be. Dang. So, so I was totally in control of that, but but from the outside looking in, people just think that these W two jobs. Oh, I'll, I have a job now, so I'm going to get a paycheck. Mm. But really, that paycheck can go away at any point. And that's my point right there. Yeah. You know, you just don't. If you're not, if you're not the boss, you know, it, being a boss of a company, you, you know, has its own risk, ups and downs, and stuff like that. But you're still in more control than being an employee of a company. You know, no matter you know, and no no one's exempt. It's all about the bottom line at the end of the day. And they found just cause to let yeah. you go or whatever. Then that's it. Well. You know, I, th- I don't think it's a bad idea for people to have jobs, right? W two jobs. In fact, if I had it to do over again, I probably would also, you know, get a job and work a traditional, mm-hmm. have a traditional income. It's probably a lot easier to get started um, than than starting with zero and having mm-hmm. to create it yourself. Although I think it's also limiting in a lot of ways yeah. because I think people, you know, get comfortable with a comfortable paycheck, and then they're mm-hmm. If they have dreams of making more money and, and, you know, building wealth and all that stuff, a lot of times it's like, well, I can't give up this comfortable paycheck in order to go do that. So they wind up just coasting through their whole lives and then getting to, um, 
you know, getting to retirement, hoping it's not 2007 when they do that. I know, man. So. It's it's just, <coughs> it's, it's a little bit scary. It's, and I've seen people in the same situation where um, I knew a guy that was working at this company and you rarely hear about this stuff, but this guy was working at a company for like 30 years, right? Yeah. You know, in, in our day, you know, back in my day, <laughs> you know, anyway, you don't yeah. hear that stuff anymore, but uh, they let him go for just some, you know, just because they could basically. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they brought some other people in and, and replaced him with two other people making a whole lot less money and everything. And he did not have a retirement or anything. I was like, yeah. bro, how do you, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so all I'm saying is you have to take control at some point. If you love what you do with your W2 job, then do it, you know, do you? Yeah. But then. That shouldn't uh, be where your money comes from. Right. Yeah. yeah. If that's your occupation, if that's, if that's right. what you do to occupy your time, that's cool. Yeah. But your money, your income should come from assets. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So just to get back to this idea of like gamblers mentality, we had somebody comment on one of our, our videos and he's like, yeah. he's like, oh, this, this is like, he it was a, about real estate. I don't even remember what the video was about, but it was something about real estate. And he's like, this is great. Except for when, when the market crashes and you lose everything. You okay. Know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> okay, man. So <laughs> I think it's important though, that we should address this idea because yeah, you know, housing market over, we're in real estate, we do multifamily, but that market over the last 10 years really has been just exploded, right? So we're at a point now where it seems like we're at the top. Mm-hmm. So should we continue to buy mm-hmm. at the top? Mm-hmm. Well, N- you, is this rhetorical or are you asking? No, I'm, I, okay. well, both, but okay. I'm asking you, yeah. Well, let's, let's I see. think, so, so, so the philosophy that I employ uh, is I'm buying for cash flow. Right. First, I don't care about appreciation there's going to be some pre- some appreciation. If I hold on to the properties long enough, it's going to happen. <coughs> mm-hmm. You know, statistically, you know, time equals appreciation most of the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so I'm look. So if there's a good deal and it yeah. cash flows and it hits the targets that I set for myself, then I'm going to buy. Right. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing, though. Now, where now when you can cu- can couple cash flow and appreciation. Now, let's just say the market or whatever ha- is going to happen happens and it does crash mm-hmm. and things are devalued a lot, then that's the time to go and really rake in a whole lot of as much, as much property as you're ready for, right? right. As much as, much as mm-hmm. you can. If you can, if you can buy property at a good price and you can steal cash flow, then that's the formula right there. So anyway, I don't, that's, yeah. that would be my answer to it. So if it's a good deal, I don't care what kind of economy, what kind of market it is. It's right. yes. The answer is yes. I got you. Okay. Flow. So, so what has happened to the housing market since, or a multifamily market since 2017? Mm-hmm. I, I, we, we might yeah let's up. yeah let's look it up because <clears throat> I, mean, I don't because here's the thing it's not a whole lot of a it's, I'm, I'm i can tell you this let me go ahead and give you my guess real quick because okay. i don't i don't concern myself with that stuff because i look at people like you know warren buffett people uh, like that that's been making their money the same way for many many years mm-hmm. so so what do you think i mean just guess what do you think i uh, most, most people probably know mm-hmm. right what has happened since? Oh yeah, two thousand seventeen. Yeah, it's going up. Oh yeah, yeah, oh. it's definitely going up. Yep. Um, what about rent? So, so multifamily is valued on rents, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just looking at this trend right now. It's almost doubled since two thousand seventeen. Yeah. Right, almost doubled. There you go. So, that's a huge increase in just six years. Yeah. Typically, you know, you're looking at like a four percent average growth in in the housing market right, or whatever. Yeah. But but we had like 20% in 2020, you know, and then mm-hmm. another 20% in 20. So, so st- stuff just went crazy. And that was great for people who own real estate. Um, and, and so, <laughs> so people now are like, okay, well, you shouldn't buy now. You have to wait for this crash that's coming and then you can buy. Mm. Well, there's nothing wrong with buying during the crash. Obviously we, we want to do that. But, um, I was caddying for this dude in 2017. So I was back, back caddying off and on. So this is when I first, <clears throat> when I first started buying rental property, actually I had just closed on my first deal. I think I had 30 units at the time mm-hmm. and, uh, still, still caddying and working at the parks and, and, you know, my property, whatever. And, uh, so I, I was able to caddy in this tournament and it was like a pro-am. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, I was caddying for this whole group and they were from, uh, from Kansas city. And this dude said, I was asking, talking to him about what they did and all the stuff, you know, really cool guys. And, uh, he was like one of the guys, he's like, yeah, I own a, um, uh, multifamily company. I buy multifamily 
property. I was like, oh, that's cool. I just bought my first one. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm working on trying trying to build a portfolio, whatever. So we started talking to really nice guys, trying to help me out, giving me some advice and stuff. Okay. okay. It was cool. He gave me some good ones, too. I'll give you some nuggets. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I still remember this. Um, but one of the things he said, you know, I was asking him, like, what he thinks about the market and what he's what his strategy is right now and all this stuff. And he's like, well, I have patient money. So, like, I'm just waiting for everything. It's way overpriced right now. I'm just waiting for everything to come down. Mm. So he thought in 2017 we're at the top of the market. And this is a guy who does this for a living, owns a lot of a lot of property, big big time investor firm, yeah. And he and, and he owns a yeah big time investment firm. And uh, and he's like, yeah, you know, we're at the top right now. It's going to crash soon, and then I'm going to buy a bunch of stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. We're six years later now. Yeah, yeah. And it's still <laughs> everything has doubled. Yeah. And I, I I wonder very often if that guy actually waited or if he started buying again. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah, I wonder what 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 happened. I, and I'm sure that he's not just investing for appreciation, mm-hmm. and he's probably getting cash flow from his units that he's got, mm-hmm. and he's probably happy with that. Um, and he doesn't, you know, what he was telling me basically is I don't need to go out and chase deals right now. I'm yeah. happy with what I have. I mean, he's content, right? Yeah, yeah. But at the same time trying to time the market yeah is almost impossible you can look at trends you can figure out Absolutely. what's going on and i actually don't see a huge crash coming in multifamily right now mm-hmm. i definitely see some decline but not a huge crash and i'll explain why in a minute but but this guy saw a big crash coming in 2017 one of the most educated people in the world on this subject and he saw it coming in 2017 and it never came yeah here we are and, six and years in fact, later it the opposite happened an explosion yeah. happened and yeah. and looking back i don't even know why he thought it was going to happen because mm-hmm. knowing the trends and seeing what happened in this market you know like why would you even predict it but and and even now you know we can talk about the the indicators but yeah um it's just interesting that people who try to time the market are almost always wrong until they're right one time. And that's everybody it. just remembers that one time. And that's <laughs> honestly, bro, that's what I, I think about that stuff a lot. I think people throw stuff out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to rain, you know, type yep. of thing. It's just, rain. So, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> the sky's falling, whatever the case, <laughs> just so they can be the first ones to say it, Yeah, you, you know, and and then, and there's a lot of way. And so you got indicators, you got, uh, markers and, you know, like, especially when you look at the stock market, you look at certain trends and certain, uh, 100 year marks 50 year marks and certain things that yeah. happen and you know and there's i think there's a couple of ways you can interpret some of that information you mm-hmm. know even when back in school you can draw different graphs have different types of graphs to tell a different type of story with the same criteria and i think man and and i'm not trying to get into no conspiracy theory stuff but i think people throw stuff out there to kind of season it a certain way to be like hello well maybe because this one time and this is kind of yeah. similar to that yeah you know so i don't know that's <laughs> kind of that's kind of how my mind i think most people goes. who are not that educated in real estate when they're shouting all this like yeah you know this stuff's gonna happen most people just think well prices are higher now than they used to be so yeah. there's got to be a, tra- a crash coming you know but it's all relative man <laughs> right like, you know yeah that's not really how it works but yeah. i'll tell you another nugget i learned from this guy though let's go this is a good one he said, we're going to call, call him patient money. <laughs> patient money. He said, um, he said the people who got hurt in 2008 in the multifamily space were the people who were over leveraged. So as long as you don't get over leveraged, you'll never lose money in this business. Mm. So I think there's a lot yeah. to be said about that. If you yeah. think about all of our, our uh, numbers and all the, mm-hmm. the things that we look for in a property and when we're doing our, our research and our, our evaluations, yep. Uh, our underwriting for these deals, you know, we're super conservative with debt and our, our DSCR numbers, yep. all the things that we look at are, we're really conservative. And the reason for that is a couple of things. One is that it maximizes our cash flow, but also, you know, I'm in a position right now with my properties that if everything crashed and I had to, I had to cut my rents in half, mm-hmm. I'm going to be still making money, not, not only not losing the deal, but still making money. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really what it comes down to. People who are saying this kind of stuff probably are just not super educated. Yeah. You know, the guys that I talked to last year who bought our property, they're buying thousands and thousands of units right now. And I, I asked them the same question, like, so what do you think about the market? You know, you see a you see it declining and is, does that stop you from buying? These guys own 2.2 billion, billion with, with a, a b with a b 
dollars worth of property. And uh, he said, he said, man, we buy in every market. He said, as long as our numbers make sense, we're going to yeah. buy in every single, it doesn't matter what up, down, sideways, doesn't matter. We're yeah. buying. Yeah. No I mean, what. yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Know? Yeah. That so, makes, that makes sense to me. You know, I was talking to our producer the other day, uh, <clears throat> Uh, producer Russ, Russ the producer. I don't know. We got to come up with some kind of nickname for him too. Young Russ. Yeah. 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 Young money. Can I say that? Ah. <laughs> um, but um, is that trademark. Yeah, probably. Like you know, happy birthday is finally not trademarked anymore after a hundred yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> so you can sing happy birthday on stuff now. <laughs> I heard that. Yeah, that's uh, the old um, like you go out to a restaurant, and they yeah. have their own song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, They'll copy the Barney song. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, talking to him the other day and we were talking about some real estate investment stuff and talking about potential crashes and what people say, hearsay, mm-hmm. things like that. And I said, man, no matter what happens in the world, people still have to have a roof over their head. That's right. right? Yeah. <clears throat> Whenever we bought our first property, we actually bought this type of real estate that we buy because it was, I was catting for another guy, investment banker. We we're talking about this stuff, stories, man. Listen, yeah, you, you can learn a lot as a caddy. I know. <laughs> I like the best job. Get in America. front of the right people. It's yep. really a fun job. Yeah. Anyway, um, a shout out to Caddy Master, by the way. Hey, you, you look for a job. <laughs> Keep the sea saw grass. <laughs> hey. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I was caddying for this dude. He's an investment banker, and I was telling him about my real estate stuff. You know, he's asking me what I do outside of caddy, and I, I usually don't just start talking to people about it, but some, sometimes <laughs> I ask, you know. Most of these people are super nice. They're just like down to earth folks, mm-hmm. you know, just billionaires, but fun. Mm-hmm. So this guy was like, "Yeah, man, like, what do you do outside of this?" And I was like, "Well, I, I invest in real estate. And I own, I think at that point, probably seventy units or something." He's like, "Really?" Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "What kind of like loans are you getting? Where are you going for this stuff?" We started talking about loans and stuff, and um, <clears throat> and I told him I really like mobile home parks, and he's like, "Man, you know, uh, when the crash happened, he was like." mobile home parks had the lowest default rate of any other asset class. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was like, yeah, that's one of the reasons that we started buying real estate was because, I mean, we started buying this type of real estate, the type, the first one that we ever bought was a mobile home park. And, uh, and he said, he's like, yeah, it's like people don't really like it. At that point it wasn't nearly as popular as it is now. Right. And he's like, but it seems to be the safest and, and probably most profitable yeah, you know, of all the asset classes, and so we we started out with a uh, with a mobile home park, and and we're able to get it dirt cheap, and then you know increase rents a, a ton, and, and wind up um, you know making a bunch of money off of it. So that was cool. yeah, you know, and that's the thing when people think of mobile home parks, when they think of trailer parks and yeah. stuff, yeah, mobile home communities, uh, they don't like they're not sexy to people. I remember the first time I ever walked into one that you owned and um, I was like, oh, okay, I see you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, you, see. I was like, so how long is it going to take for this to be ready? He was like, it's ready now. I was like, okay, <laughs> ready. ready for what? <laughs> well, I, I grew up around, so yeah. I didn't live in the park, but I grew up around it. So like, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was just normal for me. Well, so. see, and that's the thing. It wasn't normal for me. And mm-hmm. but but what was what became very sexy, what I really enjoy about mobile home parks or any uh, multifamily uh, property is when you look at the numbers, mm-hmm. you know, um, once I saw the margins, once I saw the the recipe, the yeah. formula for what yeah. you were doing and what you had going on. And this is when I was just starting to get into it and was like, I want to get into multifamily. Let me come work for you. And I started yeah. seeing, I was like, Oh my. So now when I see a mobile home park for sale, when I drive by one, my eye, like, it's like me looking at a red velvet cake. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I need that right now. So yeah. I, but but so so that's the thing. It's a different type of game. Yeah. It's a it's a long play. It's a smart play. It's a conservative play. And once you have your correct structures in place, then it's not gambling at all. Right. Like yeah. not at all. Yeah. 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 You can you can um you can pretty much you know estimate with a yeah. high degree of success what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so but but you never know what the future what the future holds. So like you know you can look back and see that's one of the things that we did too when we bought our first. Our first deal, we um, actually it was our second deal. I think this lady, uh, they had owned the property for fifteen years at that point. So, uh, you know, they had been through the the big crash, mm-hmm. and and I asked her like, what what happened here? Did you have high vacancy rate? What what happened with your rents? All that stuff. And she was like, well, the rents were already super low. 
But uh, she was like, you know, we really didn't have any more vacancy. We just kept our rents low. And then, you know, we, it was basically business as usual mm-hmm. through the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people have to have somewhere to live. As long as you're not gouging people on prices, you're yeah. probably going to keep your stuff full if you're in good markets. That's one of the things you have to make sure of. That's a good, that's a big yeah. one right there. <coughs> so, so, so speaking of being in good markets, that's one thing that you talked about earlier. You said you think there is going to be a decline in multifamily, right? maybe in the future. I don't know. Okay. Well, yeah, obviously. Right. But it's possible in certain areas for sure because of population decline. And that's what I was getting to with the whole. I've not heard anybody else talk about it. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just, I don't know. See, case in point, you want to be the first one. That's (laughs) what I was talking about. (laughs) Yeah. I I don't know. But like, I don't know why people aren't talking about it because, you know, you hear Elon Musk is like the only person talking about population decline. Mm -hmm. And you can look back and see that the birth rate's lower than replacement rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think that the way that we overcome that in the U S is through immigration possibly right. that, I mean, we're kind of a nation of immigrants anyway. Yep. Right. So maybe that, maybe that makes up for it in a way. I don't know, but it, you'll probably see some population decline in certain areas and then real estate will become less attractive in those areas. So that is one of the big things that I look for when I'm evaluating a market. So we always start with the market. Mm-hmm. We look at the market first. If we like the market, then we start looking for properties in the market. So I looked at uh, a couple of deals just this week that were really great deals. Uh, I, I, they were sent to me by a wholesaler, a multifamily wholesaler. And I was like, man, this these numbers are amazing. You know, this is mm-hmm. really high cash flow. What is the, what's the downside of this? Mm-hmm. And, of course, he was like, well, the downside is the septic system and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I don't understand that. Yeah, that doesn't that's bother not a big me at deal. all. Yeah. But it is for a lot of people. So mm-hmm. when you find... When you find stuff like that, that that a lot of other investors are scared of because they don't understand it, mm-hmm. then that can be a valuable thing because you, if you understand that, then mm-hmm. you have a leg up on, on the competition there. But anyway, so I was like, well, that could be the case, but let me just look. So I started looking through all the numbers, and then I saw the market. And <laughs> the population decline in this market was like 10% per year. Ooh, yeah, huge wow. population decline. Uh, the vacancy rate in this, in this market was 15%. It was two, two different little towns. Wow. One of them was 15. One of them was 20%. That's wild. Vacancy rate. Now, what? but I, and I, I mentioned that to the guy and I was like, you know, I'm not interested in this because of the market. And then he tried to, he was still trying to sell me. He was like, nah, man, look, th- these are long-term tenants that have been in place. I'm like, yeah, because their rents are half of what they should be. Yeah. If I raise the rents to what they should be, then I'm going to get a 20% vacancy just yep. like everybody else does in Absolutely. this town. And it's going to get worse if the population keeps declining here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, like, that's one of the big things you have to think about. You got to look at the market. You yeah. got to understand what those numbers mean. What makes a good market? Look for markets that are attractive to people, where people are coming yeah. to, not moving away from. And so, um, that was, you know, we I wrote that deal off, uh, and then I had another one in Alabama, very similar, mm. um, same thing. I was like, man, this is a great. This deal looks really good. Huge value add opportunity there. But um, same thing, just that's a, so, a mar- really bro, bad market. That's so, so good. And that's how you hedge your bets. I know we're talking about gambling and stuff, but that's how you hedge your bets. Like, so what ways do you hedge your bets? You got to look at this, the extenuating circumstances also, yeah. not just the, okay, I got two pair in my hand, but it's four a four-card flush on the board, right? You know, yeah. it don't matter what's in your hand. Or it don't matter what, sometimes what that deal is. Like you said, you look at the market itself, right? Mm-hmm. So it's – if you got a great situation in a terrible decline, let's just say you you were trying to buy multifamily in Detroit when they went through all their stuff. Yeah. You exactly. see what I'm saying? It don't matter what kind of deal you had. If everybody's moving away, yep. you know. So that that brings you to another thing. So they, one of the things that we look for in a market is we don't want to have a market that's, that's dominated by one industry. Industry, right. <clears throat> so Detroit's a great example. Mm. Dominated by the automobile, car industry. The Motor City. Yep. And then all those jobs – went somewhere else and all those jobs were gone from Detroit. So everybody left and mm. it was a ghost town for a while. I think now it's getting built back up. I it actually is. know some people who invest there and do yeah. well. But, so check uh, this out. Let me say this too then. So that's one thing we talked about a little bit earlier in the show as a W2 employee, <coughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Being there, they, they've been, it's the motor city. They've been there forever, yep. all that stuff. And then they are gone. So what happened to those yep. people? They had to change their whole situation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Type of thing. Oh, that's, that's yep. scary. But anyway. So so think about this. Back in, I don't remember when. It was before I was born. Maybe in the 70s or something. But uh, um, in our hometown, there yeah. was a big military base. Pretty large base. And uh, all of a sudden, mm-hmm. I think it was Jimmy Carter, shut that base down. Mm-hmm. Late 70s. In the 70s, yeah. yeah. So 
um, base got shut down. Mm. All of a sudden, all those tens of thousands of people who lived here mm. have nowhere to work. Mm. So they're most of them are getting shipped to somewhere, some other base, right? So they're they're gone, and then all that housing that was occupied by those people, if they're living off base, yeah, is gone. So It'd so be- like we we're close to a couple of towns that are that are smaller towns. Um, and then there's one military base close to us in a town that's probably uh, probably a hundred thousand people and fifty thousand people work on the military base there. Ooh. So, so half that of area the population was, could leave. Would you stay away from investing in that area? So it depends. It mm-hmm. depends on the rest of the market. Mm-hmm. So um, I wouldn't necessarily stay away from a market with a military base or something like that. It would depend on a few things, but um, but you have to know that that's a possibility that that stuff mm-hmm. can happen. Mm-hmm. So if you're banking solely on this population of of tenants in your property, mm-hmm. then you, you, you just have to know that it can go away. For what we're doing, yeah. yeah. I, I remember reading, I can't I can't remember what book it was, uh, one of those real estate books that I've read, and this, uh, this guy wanted to get into real estate to some capacity, mm-hmm. and he couldn't find a place to get in. So he, he got wind from a friend of a friend that there was going to be a huge building project going on in some obscure town in Idaho or something like that. Yeah. So he went out. He saw it was coming. It was they had to plan. They had to plan in the works in like a two years, year and a half away. So he went out and built some apartments and made them short term rentals mm-hmm. and killed it for like yeah. a year type yeah. of thing. Yeah. And then, um, and then he ended up selling it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because he knew that once the project was gone, then they had to do something different with it and everything. So yeah, that right there, he was kind of he had some information. <laughs> he was predicting what was going on, but that was a short term situation. Mm-hmm. That was a gamble, right? Yeah, that yeah. was definitely a gamble. But what we're talking about is like a lot more sustainable stuff. Like, so, 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 like you said, military town, you don't shy away from those, but like, how, what percentage of the population is military? What percentage mm-hmm. of the jobs come from military based type of things, right? right? So, what right. is there a certain percentage? What would happen see? if that went away? Yeah. If that and, went away, yeah. And what are the chances of it going away? So, we, we live point. by a nuclear base. Chances of that going away are probably smaller yeah. than, the, than the other base, right? So, um, so that's, you know, stuff like that you have to think about. What we're typically looking for in the market is that it's not dominated by one industry that, that you, you know, we want to see less than 25% of jobs coming from that one industry. Mm-hmm. And, and that's like the max, right? So if you have one one employer there, one business, let's just say it's one business, but it could be like Detroit where it's, it's one industry, but mm-hmm. let's just say it's one business, that business shuts down or something happens, it goes to a you know, a different location. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe you're, you're at a, in an area where there's a big, you know, plan of some sort. Like Rayonier or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Or, or a Tesla plant, you know, and yeah. then they moved to Texas all of a sudden there and now <laughs> that whole town is gone. Right. Or, or these places I was looking at were, were in Pennsylvania. I know like mining is a big thing yeah. there. So like, mm-hmm. um, you know, or, or maybe there's like oil drilling that's happening mm-hmm. in, the, in this one town. Yeah. And it explodes that that economy for a short term, but then mm-hmm. all of a sudden it just disappears too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's what we're looking for, and we don't want to see that stuff because we're not gamblers. We don't want to yeah. gamble on that stuff, right? So we want to see long term, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the appreciation that that can happen over the long term, and we want to make sure our cash flow is going to be steady for the long term. Right, too. right. I would love to go back and do a case study <clears throat> and see what the vacancy rate was after the the base left, uh, yeah. you know, just see yeah. kind of, and then also the growth and what they did to kind of get it back. Cause get right now that, the market now is a great market, you know? Yeah. And that base is now active as a, you know, a law enforcement training right. center. So we take, let's yeah. see how you say it. We take. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, you know, that stuff is, is a big deal. It re- kind of reminds me of Williamsport, Pennsylvania, which, so I'm like a huge fan. I was a baseball player growing up. I always mm-hmm. wanted to go to the Little League World Series. That was like one of my dreams growwing up. I mm-hmm. never did. I did play in the U-Triple-S-A World Series a couple times. But the what? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the who? <laughs> um, <laughs> so we didn't have Little League here, though. We had U-Triple-S-A. Okay. But no, there's, there wasn't a Little League program here at that time. I don't know if there is now. Okay. But, uh, North Georgia had them. So there was like, uh, I remember watching like, Cartersville and a couple of North Georgia and Warner Robins was yep. in it a few times. Yep. Anyway, I always wanted to go. That's right. And I remember um, somehow stumbled upon this this uh, story about Williamsport becoming an oil mining town or oil mm. whatever. I guess it was oil or coal mining. I don't remember. But um, there was like something like that happened. There was all of a sudden this rush there. And like the average 
uh, income in this town shot up way past six figures. And like all these guys were coming in and uh, young guys who were hard workers mm-hmm. and they're going into, I think it was a coal mine. I don't remember, mm-hmm. but they're going into this mine, whatever. And, um, and they're working super hard and they're, but they're, you know, hundred hour weeks, but they're making three, four, five thousand dollars a week. Mm-hmm. So they're making really good money at 19 years old. And what year was this? Uh, I don't remember, but I was in college okay, when okay. this happened. So it was recent enough. Okay. I mean, I'm not that old. I was right? about 30 years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I remember reading a story about this guy who owned a car dealership there, and he realized that all these young guys were making tons and tons of money, and they all wanted trucks. And so he just replaced every car on his lot Smart. with a truck, mm. and he's like, high-end brand new nice pickup trucks Mm. and he was selling them like crazy he couldn't keep enough of them he made millions of dollars off of it wow but then i think it lasted maybe six or eight years and then all of a sudden it was done and they were everybody was gone wow and so then all this industry that had built up like these bars and restaurants and all the stuff that had just Mm -hmm. like come in and started to thrive during this time were just all of a sudden gone Mm. And so that's the kind of stuff that you don't want to, you don't want to go in and build this huge apartment complex in that city. Yeah. And then six years later, there's nobody to live in. Yeah. That's the thing. You shoot up like a weed with no roots, you know, with nothing good to to keep you watered and and grounded. Then, Mm -hmm. you know, then that's, oh man. Yeah. I probably butchered that story about Williamsport, but yeah, it's all good. But we get the gist. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We we understand where it's coming from. (laughs) It's been a long time since I read it. I'm not that old, but you know. Yeah. It was a while back. Rick Van Winkle <laughs> over here. <laughs> so anyway, that I think that's that's one of the big things. It's one part, one, one aspect of it. Yeah. But we're you know people who are buying to flip houses or whatever. That's fine. Right. But you have to know in a market like this, in any market, the the you know everything could stop at one time. You know, in, and if this project's going to take you six months, yeah, or three months, or however long it's going to take. Um, during that time frame, you don't know what's going to happen. I don't care who you are. You can't predict exactly what's going to happen in three or six months. You just can't. Mm-hmm. So, but with, with what we're doing, you know, we can look at our cash flow. We can set parameters to where we're being conservative. And we know that no matter what happens, unless something just ridiculous happens, an asteroid hits or something, then we got yeah. bigger problems, right? right? You got bigger fish to fry. So, <laughs> so unless just everything collapses and the world's mm-hmm. in chaos, then we're going to be safe at least. And at worst case scenario, we're not making money, but we're not losing money. Even, so. even the, the, uh, even during COVID, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you yeah. Know. That was scary, man. For, for, yeah. For talk us. about, talk about that a little bit yeah. with, with the, yeah. Cause that's the closest thing we've, you know, the most recent and closest thing that people would think about, Oh, what if we have another pandemic or something yep. happens? Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is some big mistakes that I made during that okay. time. I'll talk about all that stuff. So, during COVID 2020, um, we actually were, were, were going to buy, um, a hundred units. Our goal was to buy a hundred units and we were probably going to blow that out of the water, honestly, mm-hmm. during that, that time frame. Um, so February of 2020, I went on vacation and a broker sent me a deal, um, in a right by where I invest. And, um, the deal was 30 units. Uh, it was a 30 unit deal and it was only, it was very cheap, $500,000 or something. Ooh, so we, uh, we put that, that deal under contract. We, we made an offer on that one at the same time. He had another deal that was 20 units. Yeah. So we made an offer on that one, sent an, sent an LOI in and, um, we didn't like that deal quite as much. So we had, made a lower offer on it, but we got the first one under contract, had the LOI out for the second one. Somebody else wound up getting that one under contract. (laughs) So then that was February of 2020, right? So COVID was, we were kind of starting to hear about it, but it wasn't like nobody was freaking out yet. Mm -hmm. Well, a week or two later, everybody started freaking out. (laughs) (laughs) So we were in our due diligence period. We had walked the property. Um, We had a financing contingency. Uh, we started talking to our banks about what was going on with COVID and they were like, um, well, uh, we don't really know what's going to happen. Then the eviction moratorium started coming down the line and they're Mm -hmm. like, we don't know if people are going to pay rent because they don't have any fear of being evicted. Mm -hmm. You can't evict them. So we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So we were like, okay, so we wound up backing out of that 30 unit deal. 
the person who had the 20 unit deal under contract backed out as well. Mm. Uh, same, same thing happened with them. Um, and then, you know, somebody else came in and scooped those properties up. So we were really scared that people weren't going to pay rent, but we didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, we wound up only having one person who really took advantage of that and like, you know, just lied about losing their job and, and didn't, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a, a weird situation, but yeah. we wound up in court with that person. Um, and they actually did not grant us the eviction because the guy said he lost his job and he couldn't pay rent and all this stuff. That was not true, but it didn't matter because at least in our town, the judge said if they, all they have to do is bring me this form saying that they lost their job. I don't care what the facts are. If they say this, then you can't evict them. Right. Wow. So, um, that, I think the law was that they had to be negative in, negatively impacted and all they had to do was say it. They didn't have yeah. to actually prove it. Even though we called his boss and proved that he was still working. <laughs> yep. I remember that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. Whispering pies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that was the only person though. Everybody else was, was pretty good. We mm -hmm. didn't, you know, but here's what people don't understand during that time. Everybody's like, oh yeah, these landlords are taking advantage of people, blah, blah, blah. Well, we're like most landlords. I think it's 80% of landlords are like mom and pop operators like us. So, um, you know, we, we wind up having to lay people off for a certain amount of time. Really it was out of fear because we didn't know if people were going to pay rent. We're starting to try to talk to tenants and figure out what was going on. And, uh, so People say, well, if we don't pay our rent, you know, the, then there's also a, a mortgage moratorium. We don't have to pay the mortgage either, so it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we're paying salaries for maintenance people, mm -hmm. for managers. There's a lot of people who are impacted right. by this, you know, if if these rents don't get paid, right? And also, like, my family doesn't eat either, right? So um, so it, it, was a, a, it was really stressful. We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but it wound up not being that big of a deal for us. Mm -hmm. Um, we wound up actually not, not really losing anything other than that one unit, but we had a hundred other units and you know, 135 at that point. There you go. And so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like it affected us that much. We didn't have to actually, we did lay people off for a certain amount of time. We act, there was actually a time when, when we were not supposed to go into people's houses and stuff like that. So, right. You know, we couldn't pay maintenance guys who were on staff and, and managers and stuff to, to be there. So anyway, um, we wound up making a lot of changes during COVID that, that we, we didn't really have to make. It was just done out of fear. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the big thing was we backed out on those 50 units and didn't buy anything else the whole year mm -hmm. because we were scared of what was going to happen. And then look what happened with the market. Yeah. It just went through the roof. Yep. Right. So we probably lost millions of dollars by, yeah, yep. of, 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 uh, yeah, opportunity. Because they, at the end of the day, they were still good deals. They were still good deals. No matter the numbers made sense. On. Yeah, yeah. As long as people just didn't, like, not pay the rent, yeah. <laughs> then it would have been fine. That was the one concern we had. And and it was really all just government intrusion, right? It was yep. <laughs> stepping in to, to try to help people out, and really it winds up probably hurting a lot of people. Yeah. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, that, was, that was a big mistake that we made, and we probably could have made millions of dollars off of it, but we were trying to – you know, we were scared of what was going to happen and, and we didn't know what was going to happen with the market. And yeah. I don't care who says they can predict it. You can't predict it. Right. You don't know. You can look at trends. You can make estimated, you know, es estimates. You can make educated guesses, but you just don't know what's going to happen at mm -hmm. the end of the day. You just don't. So yep. um, that was a big lesson that I learned through through COVID. So if something like that happens again, yeah, we're probably just going to continue to move forward. And, uh, and just make sure our numbers are still conservative that yep. we're, we know what's going on. Um, you know, and if, if rents decrease, then we know we're still going to be safe and, yeah. you know, we're just going to keep, keep buying. So. so that's what it sounds like. It sounds like the way you hedge your bets with this stuff is, uh, first of all, the vehicle that you have, is mm -hmm. it, is it a sustainable, sustainable, uh, vehicle? So yeah. multifamily commercial multifamily real estate has been proven to stand the test of time. Correct. Created the most more millionaires than any other industry in American history, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's great. It's strong. So that's a good vehicle, right? First yep. of all, no matter if you're doing multifamily or not, just find a good vehicle. Secondly, uh, what kind of market do you have? You know, look at your market. Don't just look at the actual vehicle. Look at what's, you know, if you got a doggone, I know Formula One vehicle, but you got all dirt roads. That's probably not a good vehicle for that area, right? <laughs> yeah, so. that's right. That's right. <laughs> and then um, you were talking about industry and just other key performing indicators. Yeah. That's just going to support what you're trying to do. Right there, and when, yep. if you can go into it the right way and hedge your bets the right way and look at it all, 
not just looking at your hand, then um, you should be okay. Yeah, the, you know, this is kind of, it goes back to that video. I remember what video the guy commented on saying that the mar market was going to crash and we were going to lose everything. It was it was me talking about how simple it is to do the numbers in real estate. Yeah. So we have a list of KPIs basically that we're looking for in, in a market, in a property. Key and performance all you indicators. Yeah, and all you have to do really is just check the boxes. And then at the end of the day, mm -hmm. okay, well, this looks like a safe market. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but we, we're hedging our bet pretty, pretty hard. Like, yeah. It's, it, it can, <laughs> we know, we don't know that it's going to work out a hundred percent like we want, want it to. Mm -hmm. Most stuff never does. Right. Mm -hmm. But we do know that in a worst case scenario, barring, you know, an apocalypse, right. <laughs> that, <laughs> that we're going to be safe at least. Yeah. And then if the apocalypse happens, then at least we got somewhere to go and hide. I guess, Absolutely. Right? So, yeah. You got a hundred houses so, to go hide in. Yeah. Well, this is the, this is one. So to you guys that are listening and watching, what other industries do you think that could be like, cause some of you guys are looking at like, ah, uh, real estate, da, 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 da. but what industry would you put up against multifamily uh, yeah. real estate? I'm curious. Like I'm genuinely curious to see so what I else. asked that guy that and, yeah. and all what he said was staying out of fiat cash. So I'm guessing cryptocurrency okay. is what he's talking about. Yeah, but yeah. I was like, well, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm putting my cash into real assets. <laughs> so well, if he said I don't staying have, out of fiat, he's talking about commodities also, you know? Yeah. I mean, he, I don't know. He, yeah. I, I think he's talking about cryptocurrency, maybe. maybe. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe he just doesn't know. <laughs> maybe just throwing out words. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe. But anyway, I think there's there's a couple other things that I that I want to mention about about this stuff. I think you know I think it's important yeah. that um, when you're looking at these markets and you're trying to figure this stuff out, you kind of understand the the long term trends. Like we don't know what's going to happen, but. Let me tell you why I don't think there's a huge crash coming in multifamily. I mm -hmm. do think that there's some some pullback for sure. Yeah. I don't know. And if it happens or not, I'm going to be fine either way. Right. It doesn't, you know, I don't invest in a way where I'm relying on this market going one way or the other. Okay. But it, back in 07, when this housing market started to crash in 08, 09, 10, these were, you know, this how the big crash that happened. So... My, my dad's in the construction business mm -hmm. and um mm. so i was you know had a little bit of a relationship with that side of it because i was around it a lot worked worked with him a lot growing up and stuff and he had a crew of about 30 guys that he was running at the time in, in 07 but by 08 09 um he had about three guys left he had basically wow. kept his top three guys and everybody else was gone his business had decreased a lot and that is a sort of a microcosm of what happened yeah which was that people stopped building mm -hmm. because, you know, there was so much turmoil in this industry um, and people were not able to get loans yeah. and there was a lot of stuff happening. So construction stopped. Yep. So we got to this point in the next few years where the new starts, the new construction was not keeping up with the, the demand, demand for housing. Right. So when, when all this stuff started to explode recently, a lot of the reason for that was that we were still underbuilt from 10 years prior. Right. So 12 years prior, whatever. So right now, you know, construction exploded in the last few years. It's mm -hmm. been tons and tons of construction, which is what we needed really. Um, but then the government stepped in and raised rates, right? The fed came in and raised rates Yeah. and government started to sort of intrude into this market again, <laughs> again. And in this, in this time, I don't understand the logic at all because there there is nothing that can be. Oh uh, well, I do understand it. I guess a little bit to try to fight inflation because they're just creating so much new money from nowhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they had to raise interest rates. Yep. So now the housing market's slowing down mm -hmm. because interest rates are really high and people can't get loans again. Right. But we still don't have enough housing. Same we're problem. still yeah we're still underbuilt. So we still don't have enough housing for people. But prices are artificially being lowered because mm -hmm. interest rates are being increased. Mm -hmm. So I don't see how that leads to a crash unless interest rates continue to increase, right. which is, again, it's, it's not a, a true test of the market. This is an artificial manipulation of what's actually happening. Right. So demand is still really high and supply is still low, mm -hmm. which is good for investors. Which is good for the investor in the long run, and it should be good in the short term. But because government has stepped in to stop it from happening, mm -hmm. it's actually probably going to hurt some investors. And you already kind of see that with people who have adjustable rate 
loans. Yeah. Um, so l- the debt on the property is a very big part of this. And right. so if p- a lot of these multifamily investors and single family investors who come in and got um, adjustable rate mortgages and adjustable rate loans are now seeing those rates adjust upward yeah. and their cash flow is going away. And now they're probably going to start defaulting and that, that, that may happen. But again, that's not the full market having this big crash. That's just government manipulation. Mm -hmm. And then people who had, you know, bad loans in place are probably going to, going to get hurt. People who are over leveraged are probably going to get hurt, but people who people are going to step in and, and, and be able to take over, get those properties and still do well with those properties. Yeah. So then you got people like patient money that comes in yep. and buys one of those home, one of those properties that was defaulted on and mm-hmm. everything and secure it with his cash and not yep. have to worry about high interest rates, not have to worry yep. about, and he's not going to be in a bad situation. Yeah. You know, that's right. so, so that's when, when things do hit the fan, yep. people like patient money is going to take advantage. Yep. But he still needs to take advantage when it's just yeah. a good deal period because he might still be being patient out there, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I bet he started buying at some you think point. He, you think I, he did? Yeah, at some point, he was probably like, you know what? <laughs> yeah. I'm finding some good deals yeah, here. Yeah. I don't know. I yeah. don't know. But anyway, uh, that's yeah, good, it's, good, it's, though, yeah. I think I think you just can't you can't try to time it. You just yeah. can't. Like, mm-hmm. you just continue to, to make sure that if you're, if you're looking for cash flow, you can be super conservative with the stuff. Make sure that you find good, good cash flowing deals. Yep. And I guess we should explain what cash flow is too. We've been going for an hour and oh and yeah, yeah, it, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so appreciation, like we said, is buying low and selling high. Buying low, and selling high. You got a house yep. that you bought for a hundred thousand dollars, and it's supposed to go up to three hundred thousand dollars. You sell it at three hundred thousand, you made a profit of two hundred thousand. Right. That's, it has appreciated two hundred thousand dollars, and you're going to make all of that profit right there. Yep. That's exactly. appreciation. Yep. That's what we're saying when we're talking about gambling, yep. right? They're hoping that it increases to what you think it's going to increase yep. to. There's right. a there are ways, especially in multifamily, that, but the, in, in single family as well, there are ways to force appreciation. Yeah. But you never really know because the market still determines a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So, um, but then cash flow is basically the money you have left after all the bills are paid. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what we look for. We want to get that check every month. I don't mm-hmm. care about the big check, although that's great too. But I'm not looking for that big one-time check, and then right. I got to go do another deal, and another deal, and another deal. I'm looking for the monthly checks that come in on the first of every single month. Absolutely, no matter what. So if people are saying you, but you could sell a house and make sixty thousand per house. Okay, but if I had twenty, uh, twenty apartments that were making me five hundred dollars a month, and then I yeah. got twenty more, yep. those little checks that you know, what I'm saying it's a yeah. lot more. It's a yeah. lot safer. You can do one deal that makes you ten thousand a month. Yeah. Or you can do one deal that makes you a hundred thousand, and it seems like the same thing. But over time, mm-hmm. you wind up getting those those checks every single month, and you get the appreciation that comes along with holding it for a, enough enough time, yep. and you know maximizing the efficiency and the tax stuff. benefits you get from it. Yeah. It's so many. We you wind up yeah. yeah not paying taxes on that money at all most of the time, mm-hmm. um, and then yeah, it's just a it, it, to me. There's not even a comparison. It's like <laughs> it doesn't even it doesn't even compare. Yeah, um, you know, investing for cash flow for me is just what makes the most sense. Yeah. And, uh, so the way I used to say it all, all, all the time is like, if you play a monopoly, what I, what I tell my, what I used to tell my kids, they love playing monopoly now because we talk about real estate is you don't win monopoly by going around the board and seeing how many times you can, you can pass go to collect $200. Yeah. Like that's what like W2 is just like going around, see how many, how many paychecks you can pick up. You win the game by picking up property pick, because when people land on, they pay you every single time. So it's, a, yeah. it's about cash flow. Yeah. Right. So even if you land on somebody's property, it don't matter because, you know, you got money coming in. So after all the bills are paid, what are you making? Yeah. Forever, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. Forever. Right. And then that compounds on, on top of its, uh, you know, on top of itself as you get more, yeah. more and more property. And, uh, and then you grow equity in the, in the deal. And then you wind up being able to acquire more with mm-hmm. that equity. And, uh, and you can also pull the equity out and not pay taxes on it and keep the money. Ugh. And so like it just, in every way, what we're doing Makes more sense in my mind yeah. than, you know, gambling on what's going to happen in the market in yeah. three months or six months or whatever, you know. So, um, yeah, that that just, to me, makes a lot more sense. Yep, me too. So, cool. All right. All right. Well, we'll see y'all next time. On the flip side. <laughs>